The Night Beat starts right now. You just got uh, you know, the outnumber the outnumber the evil is, is what we what have in place right now. Lavernia ISD confronting the issue of school shootings as students return to classes today. Some staff brought weapons. We take a look at the district's guardian program. And Bear County investigators now trying to help solve a new string of arson cases in a neighboring community. We hear from a victim coming up. But first. It's being called the perfect storm with rising costs. Rent has become out of reach for more local families, and though there aren't enough affordable housing units either to help them. That's right. Now those families are ending up at Haven for Hope, which is already over capacity. So what now? The night team's Patty Santos tells us what the city's doing now to create more affordable housing now and also in the future. I didn't really want to be here, but uh, under the circumstances that I was going through, I had to come. More and more families like Astrid Skinners are turning to shelters and area organizations that help those struggling because they can't keep up with the cost of living. 42% of the families coming to us have income, and so they have income. They just don't have enough income to pay the average rent of $1,300. Haven for Hope attributes the rise in need to the end of the eviction moratorium, rising inflation, and increased cost in housing. CEO Kim Jeffrey says only 2% of the units in our community are considered affordable to low or extremely low income families. We need more funding to be able to catch up and get ahead. Ed Hinojosa with Opportunity Home San Antonio says their income based rent program helps qualifying families pay only 30 percent of their income. Prior to COVID we had a wait list of people waiting for housing of about 35,000 families. Today we have about 70,000 families so it's it's doubled. The short term solution is finding housing or landlords that will help create affordable housing. The long term solution is building it. In May, San Antonio voters passed a $1.2 billion bond that will help do that. We're going to have actually next month where we'll start out with our competitive process of uh, we know that there's groups out there that are ready to go to do this work, to build these units that will come with services. Leaders promise affordable housing is being built or will soon break ground. The next hurdle is convincing communities to allow it. Some communities don't want uh, affordable housing in their neighborhoods. And leaders tell us affordable housing is coming. Last year, the city of San Antonio approved the Strategic, Strategic Housing Implementation Plan, or SHIP. That aims to create 28,000 affordable housing units by 2031. Tim, Stefania. Thank you, Patty. The city also facing another challenge. Their homeless street outreach program is filled with vacancies. The positions are meant to work with the chronically homeless and try to help connect them with shelters, detox programs and other services. It started back in February of last year with 11 positions. They had five people resign from the job and one of the positions downtown has never even been filled. Instead, the city is now contracted with Centro San Antonio to cover it. Tonight, a father on the run. San Antonio police say that he's accused in the death of his six month old son. So right now they need your help finding the man that you see on your screen. He's 24 year old Ronald Williams. Hospital staff called police when they saw the child on Sunday and they said that Williams's explanation for the injuries just didn't add up. Eventually that child died. If you know where Williams is tonight, call homicide detectives. Their number is there on your screen. It's 210-207-7635. Now to a developing story surrounding a string of fires in not one, but two counties. And investigators believe someone is behind them. We told you about the cases of arson in Atascosa County earlier this month. And now the Medina County Sheriff is working a similar investigation. The night team's John Paul Barajas spoke to one man who believes he was a victim and trying to understand how someone could be motivated to destroy another's property to this degree and to potentially even cause harm to, to someone's life. A Medina County homeowner says he got an unexpected call from the county sheriff last week. The news? His property was on fire and it appeared to be the work of an arsonist. Of that terrible possibility of losing my home and my barn and, and the investment that we have there and, and all of our property. Luckily, the fire only burned a few acres of grass before it was put out. The Medina County Sheriff's Office says nearly 20 fires that look to have been started intentionally were reported over the past week from Castroville to Dehenes. With no arrest yet, it's worrisome for those in the area. It, it is a great concern because I have a wife and four kids. 
you know, and I'm constantly on the road. I'm not always there. For this past weekend, we had rain for about over half the day, but the ground is already dried again. If that wind picks up that flame, it can jump. Meanwhile, Atascosa County is still looking for a suspect in connection with its 42 arson investigations. The Medina County Sheriff's Office tells us they think they could be connected. The Atascosa County Sheriff's Office says they haven't confirmed that just yet, but there are a lot of similarities in the fires. The Atascosa Sheriff offered a $5,000 cash reward, but says that is yet to bring in any good tips. For now, people we spoke to just want those responsible caught. Is there anything you'd say to the people responsible? <laughs> I'm not going to go on record with that one, but uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, I would like to have a private conversation with them. The Medina County Sheriff's Office says the Bear County Fire Marshal is helping them with their investigation. Atascosa has not joined that investigation just yet, but the Sheriff's Office says it is in communication with Medina County. Tim, Stephania. All right, John Paul, thank you. You know, those fires are especially concerning when you look at just how dry the summer's been, but that has changed over the last few days. We've seen short spurts of rain, and tomorrow our rain chances are a lot better. Meteorologist Adam Kasky is tracking all of this for us. So, Adam, let's talk about how much better those rain chances are. Yeah, tomorrow I see significantly better rain chances than just what we had today and yesterday. We've got a frontal boundary that's off to the north of us, and that'll be drifting southward and will boost our rain chances a bit. The moisture we had a few days ago, that good tropical moisture, that's all in northern Mexico, far west Texas, and New Mexico. Mexico. We're watching this boundary as it drifts southward. That's going to boost our rain chances into the scattered category for the latter half of the day tomorrow. So we're saying about 40% after 4 or 5 p.m. closer to San Antonio. But this is really going to hinge on exactly where you're located across south and central Texas. I'll break it down for you, have more timing, the future cast, and some more promising rain chances to talk about coming up. Thank you, Adam. A murder case coming to a close nearly two years after it began. Rafael Castillo was sentenced to 70 years in prison in the axe murder of Nicole Perry. He will be eligible for parole after serving 30 years. Before his sentencing, a gang expert told the, the jury the 27-year-old was the member of the Texas Mexican Mafia prison gang and had the tattoos to prove it. Castillo's sister pleaded with the jury to deliver a sentence shorter than the life sentence he was facing. He's always been um, loving, lovable, he's caring, he's always had a great sense of humor, always, he's, he makes us laugh all the time, he's always been respectful too. Prosecutors prove Castillo was behind the brutal killing and dismemberment of Perry. They say they were happy with the 70 year sentence. Now for a look at your headlines in your night beat news flash. An inmate found with a loaded gun, something you never want to hear. The Bear County deputy who booked that inmate into jail was suspended. The case that investigates team learned that Deputy Victor Jimenez III was given a proposed 10 day suspension at first, but then that was shortened to three days. That incident happened back in March. Investigators say the gun was found after the inmate was sent to the jail's South Tower for processing. Just days after the PACT Act was signed into law, a veteran right here at home is encouraging his fellow service members to apply for benefits. Don't wait. Go on e-benefits. Put in your claims. Um, if you can't figure out how to do a claim, come to a VFW. There's somebody here that will help you out. Yeah, John Roberts is among the millions of military veterans exposed to burn pits, and now he struggles to run or even breathe. The military regularly set up those trash fires in Iraq and Afghanistan, which forced soldiers to inhale smoke and unknown chemicals. But the PACT Act, which President Biden signed into law, allows veterans exposed to burn pits to get more health benefits. Professional basketball courts are going to go dark on Election Day this year. The NBA is saying it's a step to get more people to the polls for the November midterms. It's a rare move since the league usually doesn't take full days off in the season. The Texas Organizing Project in Bear County gives a big thumbs up to this idea. It says that it's one less barrier for voters on November 8th. Mark that down. That's Election Day. And by the way, the Spurs are planning to get the word out on voter registration over the next few months. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. More students are returning to class and now a local pediatrician is offering some advice to parents, what she says you'll want to look for as those kids come home from school in the coming weeks. That's coming up. Also, another local school district is arming staff as kids return to class. 
Our Lee Waldman is going to show us how it's working out. It's next on The Night Beat. A former Border Patrol agent will learn his fate here in Bear County. The capital murder trial for Juan David Ortiz will be held in October. Ortiz is charged in the murders of several people back in 2018. All of the victims were found shot to death just weeks apart near I-35 north of Laredo. Court records show Ortiz will be extradited to Bear County on October 17th. His trial scheduled to start on the 21st. And now we're continuing our coverage on the Guardian program. We know that school boards can decide to arm select staff members. Mixon Smiley School District has had that program for years. And this year, Natalia ISD is training employees for the program. And now, Lavernia ISD is in the process of arming some of their own staff just as students began school today. The district tells the night team's Lee Waldman that it believes this is the future of school safety. At the start of the school year, we'll have, we'll have guardians on our campus protecting our kids. Safety and protection is paramount every school year, but especially in the wake of the Robb Elementary tragedy. If you drive around the campuses, you'll see some additional fencing has gone up and um, you know, trainings that have taken place. Uh, there's a lot of things that, that we were reactive to as far as, you know, trying to secure the property a little bit more, but we had a lot of great things in place already. Lavernia ISD approved plans for armed staff on campus just weeks before the Uvalde shooting. Dr. Michael Duffick, the district's director of safety and security, says the Guardian program was met with 88% approval from the community and 80% approval by the staff. But a lot of the ins and outs of the program are being kept quiet. Can you say how many Guardians there are going to be? No. Okay, yeah, we're going to keep them com completely comfortable. I, I won't even let us, like our principals won't even know who the Guardians are. It's a, it's a very, very small group of people who will know. The signs are up at every campus, letting everyone know that teachers are armed and ready to protect. It was just a, it was a breath of fresh air to, to have them and see them and, and know that people can see. Um, we're not just saying it, you know, we are, we are implementing it. Duffick previously worked at Nixon Smiley ISD. It's had a guardian program for five years. In a statement, the district said, quote, the success of its program hinges on the ongoing rigorous training, continued community support, and partnership with local law enforcement, unquote. The state requires guardians to have classroom and weapons training, along with an annual psychological exam, a license to carry, and submit a random drug test. While today was the first day of the new Guardian program, Duffick believes this is something more districts should adopt when it comes to protecting kids. So this is just something they can do to have that protection as well without having to pay for additional SROs. Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. While Lavernia is relying on staff, one Comal County man has a slightly different proposal to protect local schools. What he says sets his plan apart from others. That's tomorrow night on the Night Beat. And you know, as our kiddos head back to school, pediatricians at University Health System have advice for families. Dr. Dina Tom says that eating and sleeping well are vital for students. She says that teens need about eight hours of sleep and younger kids need about 10 hours. It's normal for children when they go back to school to come home later in the day and be exhausted. My kids kind of get a little bit moody in the afternoons. They might be, um, you know, a little upset about things. And that is a sign of them being tired. That's normal. But if you're finding that that's not really improving as school goes on, you're really having to wake them up in the morning and they're exhausted. They don't want to go to school or they come home and they want to take a nap. Those are signs that they probably need more sleep and they probably need to work a little bit on it. You need to work on their diet. Speaking of, when it comes to breakfast, Dr. Tom says that things like oatmeal, eggs, and yogurt can help them stay focused at the start of the school day. Take a live look outside with live cam tonight. Looking down there at I-10-410 interchange on the northwest side. We need some rain. This is, and this is what we're talking about, right? You, I've been watching your forecast, Adam, and I'm getting super excited when I see all those rain chances there. Right. So tell us about that. Yeah, we do have more opportunities for rainfall. Doesn't mean we're all going to see it, no. But uh, locations that especially missed out in the previous tropical moisture that dumped heavy rain south of town, looks like those places that missed out are going to have a better opportunity tomorrow. Let's get right to the rain chances tomorrow. I said before, really hinges on exactly where you're located within our area. Around San Antonio, about 40% coverage. You get up into the hill country, even higher. We're talking Kerrville, Candelia, Comfort, even near Bernie, uh, Smithson Valley, Canyon Lake, Fisher, 
Spring Branch, even toward New Braunfels, it's about a 60% chance. But then the farther south you are, the lower your odds. So basically rule of thumb tomorrow, along and north of Highway 90, that's where we have the best chance of rain. And that's where it's going to be the most widespread. The ingredients are there, they just need to get mixed together properly. And it looks like we will get our lift from this very weak and now stalled frontal boundary that already has some activity along it, not just this afternoon, but even into the nighttime hours now some showers and thunderstorms across parts of North Texas. This is going to slowly drift southward and help provide the lift that our atmosphere needs in order to kickstart some showers. The wind converges and comes together along that boundary and when it hits, it can't go down because of the ground. So it's forced to go up and that creates the lift that we need. So noon tomorrow, a lot of sunshine. Most of the day, actually pretty sunny tomorrow. It's later on in the afternoon. Notice three o'clock activity starting to develop up into the hill country. Best coverage north of Highway 90 and in the hill country. Four o'clock drift southward. Five o'clock we see some development a little closer to Bear County and San Antonio. And then into the evening hours, even past sunset, we're expecting this widely separated activity, but it really doesn't last a whole lot farther south of Highway 90 or south of I-10. We'll see a little bit of activity along the coastal plain there, but again, best opportunity is along and north of Highway 90 and I-10. We also have this little area of disturbed weather in the Western Caribbean. Now, this is near Honduras and Belize very disorganized, moving to the northwest toward the Gulf of Mexico. Right now, National Hurricane Center has it flagged as a 30% chance of developing into an actual organized tropical system. Odds are still against it, but they're not zero. It gives us a 20% chance of rain on Sunday. So widely separated, isolated to scattered tomorrow and Friday. Weekend generally dry. And then we get into next week, the pattern shows promise. Okay, right now we have it at a 30% chance, but this is the type of pattern that gives us the potential to raise those rain chances in the days ahead. We just need to see some more information, but the potential's there. There's hope for some soaking rain next week. Check back in for updates. 97 the high today, that's a degree above average for this time of year. Right now we're at 90 degrees, dew point is 66, light southeasterly wind, 84 Eagle Pass, 88 Gonzales, 87 Helotus, Converse 87 degrees, and Castroville at 88. We start the day tomorrow at 78 degrees, good amount of sunshine through the early afternoon, top out about 98. Wouldn't surprise me if we hit 100, but I think we'll be a degree or two shy. And then those rain chances spike later in the afternoon and evening. By and large, below 100, a few exceptions out there. Seguin and New Braunfels could briefly hit 100. And high temperatures, for the most part, mid-90s going forward. We're still just one day away, one 100-degree day away of the record, and doesn't look like we'll hit it unless we get that opportunity tomorrow briefly. Nice to see all those rain chances. Thank you, mm -hmm. Matt. All right, now let's talk about the Cowboys. They had a practice. They did. The Chargers, how did that go? Dual practice. If you're on the defense, you had a very, very good day. If you're on the offense, better luck next time. Uh -oh. <laughs> when we come back. And one reason why they were missing a key player today. What's wrong with C.D. Lamb? We'll give you an update on that. And the Spurs released their schedule and out-of-market schedule as well. Coming up. Camping with KZAT, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys began two days of dual workouts with the Chargers of South of Los Angeles today, and concern was high. That's because C.D. Lamb did not work out. Word leaked out it was due to a foot injury. That's the last thing the Cowboys need, given the fact they're already super thin at that position. What with Michael Gallup recovering from offseason ACL surgery and James Washington foot injury in the first week in camp and could miss up to 10 weeks. And don't even bring up the fact the Cowboys got rid of Amari Cooper and Cedric Wilson, signing with Cleveland and Miami, respectively. But according to Cowboys Vice President Stephen Jones, it's just a cut on his foot, a cut that required stitches, according to reports, but no one would say how he was injured. But Jones also praised the run game, which has been emphasized this season, starting with Zeke. Definitely want to, you know, emphasize the run game and, you know, utilize uh, Tony and myself, uh, 
you know, I think I think it would definitely wear us down a defense when you got two backs coming at you. And uh, you know, if we if we can uh, run the ball efficiently and uh, control that line of scrimmage, we're going to be that much better of an offense. All right, maybe one reason why the Cowboys often struggle today against the Chargers defense. Remember, they just signed Duran James to a four years, 76 and a half million dollar contract extension, making him the highest paid safety in the NFL history. But the USL MVP, Cavante Turpin, who is making some noise at wide receiver, made one of the big plays today. But during a two minute drill, Dak Prescott in the Cowboys office got shut down first by linebacker Khalil Mack with a sack and under pressure. Prescott gives up an interception after the pass bounced off Ezekiel Elliott. That's one of two interceptions today, but the defense looked great again. Let by Micah Parsons, who had more than one sack. I think today we came out, really competed hard, especially made big strides from last week. I think everyone came out today. Um, it was great to have some of the guys back that might have set out last week. And, you know, I just felt like the energy was there, and that's kind of like the standard we need to play with every game this year. All right, also veteran linebacker Anthony Barr, who was signed by the Cowboys after eight seasons in Minnesota, worked out today. Our San Antonio Spurs announcing today they will tip off their 50th anniversary season at home on October the 19th against the Charlotte Hornets. It's the beginning to see if they can get back into the playoffs after missing out the last three seasons with Keldon Johnson as a new face of the franchise. Here's some key days. And keep in mind, a majority of the home games this year will tip off at 7, not 7.30, and followed by a New Year's Eve game in Dallas, uh, January 7th against Boston. That's big Derek White coming home and DeJounte Murray two times, once in Atlanta and once in San Antonio after his stay here didn't end so well. The San Antonio Spurs have also released the dates of their four out-of-market games will be played outside of the AT&T Center in the Alamo City this coming season. The biggest will be on January the 13th in 2023 when the Spurs return to the Alamo Dome for their 50th anniversary celebration. Remember that Spurs left the old Hemisphere Arena after the Alamo Dome was opened in 1993 and that was their home until the then SBC, later AT&T Center opened up in 2003. The Dome will be configured to hold 65,000 plus on that night with the NBA tennis record for a single game set at 62,046. That was set on March the 27th, 1998. The Chicago Bulls faced off against the Atlanta Hawks in the Georgia Dome. Let's see if the Spurs can break that. The Silver and Black also released their two games in Austin for April 6th and 8th in a new Moody Center. And the lone date in Mexico is set up for Mexico City for December the 17th. So here are the opponents for those games. Miami will be in Mexico City. Golden State, big game. Of course, is the defending NBA champs in the Alamo Dome 630 on the 13th. And then, of course, in Austin, two games. Portland on the 6th and Minnesota on the 8th. Of course, Austin's pretty cool. I actually played the last game in the, that old gym because of Baylor, and now I'm going to be playing the first NBA game there. There you go. That's the reaction we got for the Spurs draft picks tonight as the Spurs Inclusive Sports League at Morgan's Wonderland, where kids 12 to 14 participated with all three of the Spurs' first round draft picks. Our big game coverage previews take us to Southwest High School next. Our big game preview is taken to Southwest High School, where is where we find the Dragons breathing fire again this season after going 5-1 District 13-5A Division 1, finishing his area finals with an 8-4 overall record. Head coach Alex Franco uh, welcomes back eight starters, three on offense, five on defense. After losing 41 seniors, the Dragons will have to rely on their defense to start this season behind linebackers Blake Chesser and 101 tackles and an interception. And Hudson McKendrick was another 100, both making all district last season. You know, this school has made the playoffs 16 straight years. We've won a playoff game six straight years. And what that allows us to do is it makes our job as coaches easy. The groups before us, they were just extremely hard workers on and off the field. So it sets the tone and the young guys see that and they see what it takes and what it's all about. For us, we're just trying to keep the streak alive. I mean, it's the same as every other year. We're going to do it. We're going to work. We're going to work for it, obviously. Same tenacity, the same like mindset to win. Um, and hopefully just keep the streak alive of the playoffs. The Southwest Dragons will kick off their 2022 season on August the 26th in Lockhart at 7 p.m. And that means the season starts one week from tomorrow. We're so close. I can Let's feel do it. it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. We'll be right back after this. That does it for the night beat. Don't forget, Good Morning San Antonio starts tomorrow bright and early at 4.30. Thank you so much for keeping us company. We loved having you with us. Now have a wonderful night and stay cool.